Welcome to lecture six of how to read and do proofs. Okay, last time you learned about the universal quantifier for all, for each, for every, for any. And when you see those keywords in the backward process, you have to show that for every object with a certain property, something happens. Do you remember the proof technique for doing that? The choose method. The choose method, okay. Now what we wanna do today is th learn the proof technique when you encounter those keywords in the forward process. And that technique is called specialization. So when you see the keywords for all, for each, for any, or for every, in the forward process, you know that for every object with a certain property, something happens. How do you create a new forward statement? This is where we use the technique of specialization. Let me give you the idea of specialization. If you ever come across one particular object with a certain property, what do you know will happen for that object with a certain property? The something will happen? The something happens, exactly. If you ever come across one particular object, let's call it X, with a certain property, you will be able to claim that the something happens. And claiming that the something happens for that particular object X is a new statement in the forward process, and that is specialization. Let me show you how this works first in a non-mathematical setting, and then let's do it in a mathematical setting. So, uh, let's suppose you want to buy a car that gets good gas mileage. And suppose you know that every car with four cylinders gets good gas mileage. So here is a forward statement with the keywords for every. What are the objects here? Car. Car. With what property? Four cylinders. Four cylinders. And what's the something that happens? Gets good gas mileage. Gets good gas mileage. Okay. You can end up buying a car that gets good gas mileage by using your knowledge here of this for all statement as follows. Suppose you are at a dealer's lot and you're walking through the, through the lot and you spot a particular car that you like. And after looking at it more carefully, you find out that that particular car has four cylinders. Because of your general knowledge in the statement A, what can you say is true about that particular car? That particular car gets good gas mileage. That particular car gets good gas mileage. And that statement that you just made is specialization. You have specialized this for all statement to one particular object with a certain property. You can conclude that this particular car gets good gas mileage. That's the idea of specialization. Here's another example. You've probably heard this one before. Every man is mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. That's specialization. From this example, you can see the following steps for applying specialization to a forward statement in which you know that for every object with a certain property, something happens. Let's use this mathematical example as we go along. So let's suppose that you know that for all real numbers x and y that are non-negative, x plus y is greater than or equal to 2 times the square root of x y. Let's look at the steps of specialization. When you see a for all statement in the forward process, think about specialization. And to use specialization, first, identify the objects, the certain property, and the something that happens. So let's go over here and do that for this example. What are the objects here? Real numbers, x and y, grab the whole thing, right? Real numbers, x and y. What's the certain property? Being greater than or equal to 0. And the something that happens? x plus y greater than or equal to 2 times the square root of xy. The second step of specialization is to identify one particular object with a certain property. Find one. Now, in doing a real proof, that's a bit of an art, finding the right object to specialize to. But for the sake of discussion here so that I can in illustrate the technique of specialization, let me specialize this for all statement here to these two particular values of x and y. Right? Those are objects with the certain property. 3 and 27 are non-negative. The third step in specialization is to write down that the something happens for that particular object that you identified. 
and that becomes a new forward statement. So can you help me with this numerical example over here? What is the result of specializing the statement A to the values x equals 3 and y equals 27? What is the result of specialization? 3 plus 27 is equal to or greater than 2 square root of 3 times 27. Exactly. 3 plus 27 is greater than or equal to 2 times the square root of 3 times 27. So all you do is replace the x and the y with their specific values and write the something that happens as a new statement in the forward process. Let's apply specialization to this statement A again. First, identify one particular object with a certain property. So let me find some real numbers, x and y, that are non-negative. For example, x equals a squared and y equals b squared. a and b obviously are numbers here. So there are particular object with a certain property. And what is the result of specializing this for all statement to this value of x and this value of y? a squared plus b squared is greater than or equal to 2 times the square root of a times b. Exactly. a squared plus b squared is greater than or equal to 2 times the square root of a squared times b squared. So all you have to do is go to the for all statement and replace the values of x and y with the specific values that you are working with. And write that as a new statement in the forward process. That's specialization. All right. Let's do it in the context of an example. Suppose you're working with a function of one variable, and you know that for all real numbers x, y, and t between 0 and 1, f of t times x plus 1 minus t times y is less than or equal to t times f of x plus 1 minus t times f of y. Before we apply specialization, let's be sure we understand the objects, the certain property, and the something that happens. What are the objects here? Real numbers x, y, and z. Correct. Real numbers x, y, and t. What's the certain property? t is between 0 and 1. t is between 0 and 1. And the something that happens? All of this stuff. How do we apply specialization after you identify the objects, the certain property, and the something that happens? You need to find specific values for x, y, and t. For example, let's specialize this statement to x equals 0, y equals 4, and t equals 2. Is everything OK? No. How does specialization work? What do you have to find? Any objects? No. What objects? With a certain property. With the certain property. What is the certain property, by the way, here? t is between 0 and 1. Oh, t is between 0 and 1. Is 2 between 0 and 1? No, you cannot apply specialization. That's why I did this example. Here you have to be very careful. When you identify your objects, be sure that they satisfy the certain property. I can specialize it to t equals a half, because a half does satisfy the certain property. See the difference? What is the result of specialization? Put the values, the specific values of x, y, and t into the something that happened. And that becomes a new statement in the forward process. And then you can just clean this up with a little bit of algebra if you like, make it look a little nicer. Let me summarize. To use specialization, when you know that for every object with a certain property something happens, first identify the objects, the certain property, and the something that happens. Then look for a particular object with the certain property. Once you've found that object and you're sure that it satisfies the certain property, then you can claim that the something happens. And writing that the something happens for your particular object as a new statement in the forward process, that's the result of specialization. OK, let's see how this works in an actual proof. A real number u is an upper bound for a set t of real numbers if and only if for every element in the set t, t is less than or equal to u. Now, let me show you a picture of this so that you can appreciate what an upper bound for a set is. This line represents all real numbers. And let's say we have a set t here. This number u is an upper bound because all the elements in this set t are less than or equal to u. Is this an upper bound for the set? Yes. 
Yes, all the elements are be in T are below this point. Is this an upper bound for the set? No. No. Is this an upper bound for the set? No. No. All of these are upper bounds for the set. Now, here's what we want to prove. If R is a subset of S and U is an upper bound for S, then U is an upper bound for R. Let's draw a picture to understand what this proposition is telling us. So here's a set S, and R is a subset of S. R is inside S. And you can see from the picture that if U is an upper bound for S, then in fact U is an upper bound for R. Now, a picture is not a proof. What is a proof? A convincing argument expressed as a sequence of applications of proof techniques that this statement is true. That's what a proof is. So what we need to do is use our proof techniques to prove Proposition 7. So, of course, you've identified the hypothesis A and the conclusion B. And what is the next thing that you should do? Choose a proof technique. Choose a proof technique. I urge you to consciously prove, choose a proof technique based on what? Keywords. Based on keywords. Look at the hypothesis and look at the conclusion and look for keywords. Do you see any keywords in this proposition? No? So what should we begin with? The forward-backward method. Okay, let's go to the conclusion here. Look at the conclusion. Who can ask a key question? How can I show that? U is an upper bound for a set. U is an upper bound for a set. You're under arrest. Why? Using a symbol. I used a symbol, right. How can I show that? What is U? A number. A number. How can I show that a number is an upper bound for a set? See, I told you it's, it's just so common to want to put in the symbols, right? This takes a little bit of practice. Okay. So the key question is, how can I show that a number, namely U, is an upper bound for a set, namely R? Now we've got to answer that question. How can you show a number is an upper bound for a set? This is, again, where we use definitions. It is so common to use a definition to answer a key question. So let's do that. Let's look at the definition here and apply it to the set R. How can I show that a, a number, namely U, is an upper bound for a set, namely R? What do we have to show according to the definition? All the elements in the set T. Not T. We're applying this to R. In set R? Right. Let's try that again. How do we apply the definition to the set R? What do we have to show that? All the elements in the set R are less than or equal to U. Or equal to U. Excellent. And that's what I'm going to write as my new statement B1. I have to show that for every element R in the set R, R is less than or equal to U. Look at B1. Do you see anything of interest? For every? A for every in which process here? Backward. backward. In the backward process. That should trigger which proof technique? Choose. Think about the choose method. Exactly. So let's identify the objects, the certain property, and the something that happens. What are the objects here? Elements R in set R. Elements R in the set R. What's the certain property? There is none. There is none. And what's the something that happens? R is less than or equal to U. Good. R is less than or equal to U. OK. Identify the objects, the certain property, and the something that happens. Next, you have to remember how the choose method works. And so let me remind you. Choose an object with the certain property. So what does that mean in this example? What am I going to choose? An element in the set R. An element in the set R. There it is. And when you choose that object, it becomes part of your forward process. You've chosen it. You can use it. And what do you have to show for that chosen object? It is less than or equal to you. That that chosen object is less than or equal to you. That the something happens. So it has to be shown that R is less than or equal to you. Now we have to fill in the details of working forward from here and backward from here. To do this, we're going to uh, use specialization. And to see how, let's turn to the forward process. So if you go to the hypothesis, one of the parts of the hypothesis is that R is a subset of S. So what can you say is true because R is a subset of S, by definition? All the elements in R are in S. Exactly. For every element X in R, X is in S. And notice that I have used the symbol X here to avoid overlapping notation. I could have used R again. But we're using R already in several places. So again, 
Notation is up to you, but I urge you to, at least at times, avoid overlapping notation. Do you see anything of interest in A2? Yes. Yes, what? The keyword for all. The keyword for all in the? Forward process. Forward process. And that should trigger you to think about which proof technique? Specialization. Specialization. Okay, so now we want to apply specialization to this for all statement in the forward process. And how does that work? Again, the first step is to identify the objects, the certain property, and the something that happens. So can somebody help me here with this for all statement? What are the objects? Elements x in the set r. Elements x in the set r. What's the certain property? There isn't one. And the something that happens? x is an s. All right. Now what you have to remember is how does specialization work? And here's how it works. You need to find an object with a certain property. In this case, that means you need to find what? A particular? Element in the set r. Element in the set R, exactly. We need to find a specific object with a certain property to use for X. That means we need to find a particular element in R. Look at the slide. Do you see a particular element in R somewhere? R? Yes, little r. Where are you looking? In A1. In A1. We chose an element R in R. Does everybody remember from the choose method? We chose an element R in R. I propose to use this object right here for specialization. Is it an object with a certain property? Yes, it is. And the result of specialization is that the something happens for this particular object. R is an element of S. R is an element of S. So the result of specialization is that the something happens for this particular object. In other words, R is in S. That's my new forward statement. Now let's work forward from another part of the hypothesis. If you go back to the hypothesis, it also says that u is an upper bound for s. Let's work forward from that by definition. What does it mean to say that u is an upper bound for s? By definition, we know that for every element x in s, x is less than or equal to u. Look at A4. Do you see anything interesting? Hannah, you're smiling. What, is, what do you notice? The keyword for all. For all where? In the forward process. In the forward process, and therefore what technique should you think about? Specialization. Specialization, correct. Okay, so again, we need to do the same thing here. We need to apply specialization. So let's identify the objects, the certain property, and the something that happens in this for all statement. What are the objects? Elements x in the set s. Elements x in the set s. What's the certain property? There isn't one. What's the something that happens? X is less than or equal to U. X is less than or equal to U. Okay. Now, according to specialization, you have to look for a particular object with a certain property. What does that mean you have to look for in this case? An element? In the set S. In the set S. Do you see an element in the set S somewhere? Where? In A3. In A3. R is in S. There is a particular object that we can apply specialization to. So what I propose to do is specialize A4 to the particular value of x equals R. And what is the result of this specialization? R is less than or equal to U. R is less than or equal to U. And that is exactly the result of specialization. And by the way, this completes the proof because if you look back at B2, this is A5 is exactly B2. See how the keywords guide us? Okay, so first of all, in specializing A4 to this particular value of x equals r, if you had not established that r belonged to s, you could not apply specialization here. You need an object with a certain property. That means the object has to be in the set S. So we know that R is in S from A3. But if you had not established that R is in S, you could not specialize this statement to X equals R. And the other comment is, notice how the techniques that we use vary as the statements change throughout the proof. When we see these keywords, we use this proof technique. When we see those keywords, we use that proof technique. Okay, again, as an exercise, what I'd like us to try and do now is learn to read a condensed proof by explaining this condensed proof as a sequence of applications of the proof techniques. 
So again, let me remind you of the definition of an upper bound. A real number u is an upper bound for a set t of real numbers if and only if for every element t in t, t is less than or equal to u. So again, here's the picture. Here's the real line. Here's a set t. Here is an upper bound. Now you'll notice that there are many upper bounds, right? Here's an upper bound. Here's an upper bound. Here's an upper bound. There are many upper bounds for the set t. Of particular interest in many applications is the smallest upper bound. So you tell me. Here's an upper bound. Here's an upper bound. These are all upper bounds. Tell me when I've gotten to the smallest upper bound. Now? Right there. That is what we call the least upper bound. And it's sometimes called the supremum of the set T. It is the smallest of all the upper bounds. In fact, one way to prove that the square root of 2 is a real number is based on the, the supremum of a set. OK, so let me define the smallest upper bound, the least upper bound. A real number u star is a least upper bound, also called the supremum of a set, T of real numbers, if and only if two things happen. First, u star has to be an upper bound. And for any upper bound u for t, u star should be less than or equal to u. Here's what we're going to prove. If v star and w star are least upper bounds for a set t, then v star equals w star. Now before I put up the actual condensed proof, what I'd like you to do is see if you can understand in words what this proposition is saying. That there's only one supremum? That there's only one upper bound, least upper bound. There's only one. Because if you had two of them, v star and w star, what would happen? They are equal to each other? They'd be the same. What this proposition is telling us is that there's only one least upper bound for a set. So this is something that I hope eventually you'll be able to do. Read propositions and try and say to yourself, well, why, what is the value of this proposition? We don't just prove propositions to harass students. That's not our goal. Our goal is to prove propositions because they are useful. They help us ultimately solve problems. OK, so what I'm going to do now is put up a condensed proof of this proposition and ask you to take a few minutes to read it. All right, now our goal, again, is to explain this proof as a sequence of applications of the proof techniques. Unfortunately, as you'll notice from the condensed proof here, there is no mention of any of the proof techniques by name that you have learned. However, I guarantee that the author has used our proof techniques. They just haven't told us which ones. So in order to understand this proof, we're going to have to do a little bit of work ourselves. What's the very first thing we need to do? Identify the hypothesis and conclusion. Identify the hypothesis A and the conclusion B. So here they are. Here's the hypothesis A. V star and W star are least upper bounds for a set T. 
and the conclusion B is V star equals W star. Okay, let's look at what the author wrote in the first sentence. From the hypothesis, both V star and W star are upper bounds. When you see the words from the hypothesis, in terms of proof techniques, can somebody tell me what do you think is going on here? T is a forward step. Uh, this is a forward step. Now, again, if you don't quite know what proof technique the author is using, you should ask yourself, what proof technique would you use? And you tell me, what proof technique would you use to get started here? The forward-backward method? The forward-backward method, why? Because there's no keywords? Because you don't see any keywords, such as there is or for all, in A or B. Okay, so if that is true, the author is indeed working forward from A. V star and W star are least upper bounds for a set T. So here's the definition of a least upper bound. V star is a least upper bound. What does that mean about V star, according to the definition? V star is an upper bound for T. Is an upper bound for T. And that's exactly what the author has written here. V star is an upper bound for T. And the same thing for W star. V star and W star are upper bounds for T. To understand where the author is going, what we should do is work backward ourselves so that we know where the author is headed. So let's work backward from B. Can somebody help me with a key question? How can I show that? Two numbers are equal? Two numbers are equal. After all, V star and W star are real numbers. So let me put up the condensed proof and ask you to take a moment to look at it and see if you can identify how the author answered the key question, how can I show that two real numbers are equal? How did the author answer the key question, how can I show that two real numbers are equal? The first number is less than or equal to the second number, and the second number is less than or equal to the first. Show that the first number is less than or equal to the second number, and the second number is less than or equal to the first number. Okay, so here's where we are. Let's look at what the author writes next. Because V star is a least upper bound for T, V star is less than or equal to U for any upper bound U for T. So what do you think the author is doing in terms of proof techniques? Working forward using the definition? Working forward from which statement? A? Yes, working forward from here using the definition. So let's look at the definition again. So now the author is working forward from the fact that V star, instead of U star, is an upper bound, is a least upper bound. So for any upper bound U for T, V star is less than or equal to U. So we know that for any upper bound u for t, v star is less than or equal to u. And that's what the author has written right here. Do you see something interesting in A2? The key word for all? The key word for all in the forward process. And therefore, what proof technique do you think the author is going to use next? Specialization. Specialization. And that's exactly what the author is going to do without telling you. Here's where we are. Let's read the next sentence, S3. In particular, W star is an upper bound for T, so V star is less than or equal to W star. What technique do you think this is? Specialization. Specialization. The author is going to specialize this statement, and that's precisely what's going on here. So in order to use specialization, let's remember how it works. First, we have to identify the objects, the certain property, and the something that happened. Let's go to A2. What are the objects? An upper bound U for T. An upper bound U for T. What's the certain property? There is none. There is none. And the something that happens? V star is less than or equal to U. V star is less than or equal to U. Now we have to look for one particular upper bound for T. Read S3. W star. W star. The author is specializing this for all statement to U equals W star. Is W star and upper bound for T, do we know that? Yes, from where? A1. The author can apply specialization to this statement using instead of U, W star. And what is the result of specialization? The something that happens? 
the something happens for W star. So what is the something happens here for W star? W star is less than or equal to U? No, be careful. Substitute U equals W star. V star is less than or equal to W star? V star is less than or equal to W star. See how that worked? You substitute for U W star and write the something that happens. And that's exactly what the author has written here. The key words in particular in a condensed proof often are a sign that the author is using specialization. All right, so here's where we are so far. This is the first half of B1. We have to get this part now. So let's see what the author writes next. Similarly, W star is the least upper bound for T, and because V star is an upper bound for T, W star is less than or equal to V star. What do you think the author is doing here? Similarly. Using the same method? Using the exact same argument. This statement right here and this statement right here, but now the author is doing it for W star instead of V star. In particular, because W star is a least upper bound for T, we know that for every upper bound U for T, W star is less than or equal to U. That's the definition, part two, of a least upper bound. Again, the author recognizes the keyword for all in the forward, forward process. process. Forward process. And so, what technique do we want to use? Specialization. Specialization. And in fact, specializes to what value of U? V star. V star. Specialize this statement to the upper bound V star for T. The result of specialization is W star less than or equal to V star. And now the proof is actually complete. As the author says, it now follows that V star equals W star because this has happened. And so the proof is done. So notice a couple of things about reading this proof. First, the techniques vary as you go through the proof, right? You, you start with a forward backward method, but then you see a keyword like for all in the backward process, you might use the choose method. Here we see a for all in the forward process, so we want to use specialization. The proof techniques change as you work through the proof. Also, the names of the techniques are omitted in these condensed proofs, right? The author made no mention of specialization, forward, backward, key questions, nothing. And finally, you have to fill in details that the author leaves out. But the neat thing about this is that every proof that I've ever seen is nothing more than a sequence of applications of these proof techniques. And if you can just figure out what technique the author is using and how the author is applying that technique to, the, to this particular problem, you can understand proofs. Okay, let me summarize specialization. First of all, when should you use specialization? Use specialization when you see the keywords for all in the forward process, in which case you know that for all objects with a certain property, something happens. How do you use specialization? First, identify the objects, the certain property, and the something that happens. And then look for one particular object with the certain property. Let's call it X find an object. Now, this object, just as a side note, often comes when you use the choose method, right? You choose an object with a certain property, that chosen object becomes the one that you use for specialization. Not always, but that's, uh, that's quite a common thing. Okay, so identify one particular object with the certain property, let's call it X, and then what can you write as a new statement in the forward process with specialization? Something happens. That the something happens. That the something happens for X. And that new statement in the forward process is the result of specialization. That completes this lecture.